Right, guys, external assessment 2023, paper two. Okay, so question number one. Polylactic acid and low-density polyethylene are both used to produce plastic wrapping film. Okay, now you will see PLA is plant-based, um, comes from cornstarch, I believe, uh, whereas LDPE, of course, comes from crude oil, petrochemical-based. <coughs> um, what have we noticed? Well, the PLA is more dense, it has a higher, much higher tensile strength, which basically means when you try and stretch it, it, it will resist breaking. Um, that, again, is kind of reflected in the fact it doesn't stretch much, whereas P LDP stretches a lot. Okay, uh, it's slow to degrade, which means it will degrade given time, but P, uh, LDP doesn't biodegrade at all. All right, this basically is a condensation polymer, and they contain, obviously, functional groups which bacterial enzymes can break down, even if it does take a while. Petrochemical-based ones are synthetic polymers that have been made from crude oil. They contain carbon-carbon links. Bacteria, bacterial enzymes cannot recognize those links. Advantage, okay, it's plant-based, which means it can be uh, made again and again and again. It's not going to run out, and like crude oil. And then LDP obviously is made from oil, which is non-renewable. Uh, disadvantage, less elongation, so to stretch less. So those are just two examples. I mean, you could have used some of the other ones there, I'm sure. But at the end of the day, any two, as long as they're reasonable, would or hopefully should be accepted. <clears throat> Compare the structure of alpha helix and beta pleated sheets in the secondary structure of proteins. Okay, now in both cases, they will have hydrogen bonds linking in between the, the different sort of um, uh, functional groups of the actual sort of polyamide, if you like, okay? Um, so that's what it says. It's hydrogen bonds between two peptide bonds. So it would be the C double bond O of one and the NH of the other. Both very polar groups and therefore able to interact via hydrogen bonds. The difference is the alpha helix is one protein chain, basically. Um, so those hydrogen bonds are intra-chain, within the chain. Whereas beta-pleated sheets can be between different chains, so therefore inter-chain, more than one chain. Uh, the significance basically is this one produces a coil. I'm sure you've seen pictures of it. An alpha helix looks a bit like a spiral staircase. Um, this one here produces a sheet. Uh, when it says a sheet, it's not flat, it zigzags, and the hydrogen bonds hold it in that zigzag shape as well. Again, please go and look at your images in your notes or Google images so you can see, have a, you know, have a visual picture in mind when you're answering a question like this. Uh, experiment was conducted uh, to investigate the potential difference produced by different galvanic cells. Three cells used are shown. Okay, so the first one is a standard silver half cell. This is not a standard cell, guys. All right, you're using a graphite electrode with copper nitrate. So therefore, this, this cannot act as an anode. All right, there's no copper metal to give up electrons. Graphite isn't going to do it. Graphite is purely there to conduct. It is not going to be able to donate electrons. So this cell will have to be the cathode, okay? Even though, you know, copper metal... And silver metal, copper would be the anode, okay? But it isn't copper metal, it's graphite. So this would be the anode, this would be the cathode. In this one, yeah, same again. So you're using graphite again. So this is definitely the anode, this is definitely the cathode. And the same here as well, okay? So we got three cells. The left-hand one is the anode every time. The right-hand one is the cathode every time. What are we asked? Predict which cell produces the highest voltage and explain why. Well, firstly, as I said to you a moment ago, this is not even going to work because obviously um, 
silver can't give electrons to to graphite when you're dealing with a more reactive metal in the compound copper nitrate. So that's not going to work. That's not going to produce a voltage at all. This one will produce a high voltage. If you go to your electrochemical series chart, which I'm doing as I'm speaking to you, the EMF of this cell, the potential difference, magnesium would be 2.36. Copper would be 0.34, so that would give us a voltage of 2.7 volts. Copper and silver, copper as the anode this time would be minus 0.34, silver would be plus 0.8, and again that would produce a voltage of about what 0.4. Six or something like that. So clearly, cell two is producing the highest voltage. Okay. There we go. All right, all done. Maximum voltage that you could get from a fourth galvanic cell constructed from any of the components. Well, obviously, you want the most reactive and the least reactive, and that would be magnesium as the anode and silver as the cathode. If you do that, you would have those two half equations and a voltage overall of 3.16 volts. Okay, question number four. Infrared spectrum of C4H10O, and it tells us it's either an alcohol, an aldehyde, or a carboxylic acid. Okay, well, that is a horrific statement to make. I don't know if you realize this, guys, but C4H10O has single bonds only. All right, C4H10 would be an alkane formula, and with an oxygen inserted between one of the uh, carbons and the hydrogens, it's going to produce an alcohol. It cannot produce an aldehyde. Aldehydes have a carbon-oxygen double bond. That would have to be eight hydrogens, not ten. Carboxylic acids would be the same. There'd be eight hydrogens. Also, there'd be an extra oxygen if it was a carboxylic acid. So that's, that's an alcohol. Full stop, all right, before we even look at what the question is. Again, I think that's a very, very poorly worded statement by QCA. Okay, so it's an alcohol. We can infer that from the broad peak there. You can look up your infrared spectrum data, guys, which is on page uh, 14. It's on the same page as the indicators we met in the last paper. So if you look that up, you'll see the alcohol is there. Okay, so that's the alcohol peak. Um, and it says compound C cannot be an aldehyde as there's no peak at 1700. There's no peak basically uh, there. But again, it couldn't be the aldehyde anyway because it's got the wrong molecular formula for an aldehyde. And oh, it, it addresses it here. Look, it says the molecular formula only contains one oxygen. So it couldn't have a COOH. Yeah, exactly. All right, but that one there, it can't be an aldehyde because of the number of hydrogens. Structural form a new pack name of two isomers of compound C. So compound C obviously is a four carbon alcohol, butan one ol and butan two ol, or one butanol and two butanol. It's more correct to put the one and the two inside the name, but Australia seems to favor it in front for some unfathomable reason. It isn't the best, all right? The UPAC system suggests the number goes inside the name, butan one all. And if you're wondering what that is, International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, it's the worldwide recognized system for naming. And the one and the two shouldn't be in front. Um, oh, by the way, guys, sorry, they were printed as or copied as one, one would go there and the other one would go there. Structural and geometric isomers. Structural isomers have the same molecular formula but a different structure. In other words, different atoms bonded to different atoms. But this time, geometric isomers have the same order of atom bonding. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Basically, what it's saying is the structures are the same. In other words, the atoms are bonded to the same atoms, but they're arranged differently in space. If you remember, this is when you have a double bond. That's the most common example of geometric isomers. And because of the double bond, you could have uh, different arrangements because the double bond cannot be rotated. I'm thinking of 
probably butuene is the most common example where you can have cis and trans butuene. Uh, properties of four monoprotic acids. Okay, monoprotic means one hydrogen will be lost when it ionizes. Okay, one and two, we are to not told. Ethanoic acid is that one there and HCl there. Um, these hydrogens here, by the way, guys, cannot be used as H pluses because they're simply not, the carbon hydrogen bond is not polar enough. Okay, so concentrations are given, H plus concentrations given, except for this one, pH is given, except for those two, and Ka there. Determine the relative strengths of acids one and two by contrasting their Ka values. Okay, so we do not have a Ka value for number one, so we're going to work it out using a little formula. Remember how to do these. H plus obviously is squared divided by 0 0.2, and then you're going to get that value there. Now, if you can't remember how to work out the pH or the Ka of a weak acid, I suggest you go and look at your um, acid notes. So if this is 10 to the minus 8 and that's 10 to the minus 4, then clearly uh, number 2 has got the bigger Ka value. The bigger Ka value means more dissociation and therefore a stronger acid. Balance equation for the dissociation, dissociation of ethanoic acid. They've included a water molecule and put that as H3O+. I'm hoping... I was going to say that they would leave the water out and just put H plus there, but maybe the two marks is for that and one mark if you left the H2O out. I personally, you know, don't see the real need for it because it doesn't appear when you do K, K questions and stuff like that. But QCA, no best. Identify whether the conjugate base of ethanoic acid is amphiprotic. Explain your reasoning. Amphiprotic means it can act as both acid and base. Okay. Well, the conjugate base would be ethanoate and it can accept a proton. So obviously it's a base, but these are not acidic hydrogens. So it cannot donate a proton and therefore it is not amphiprotic. Uh, another word for amphiprotic is amphoteric. You may have met that one as well. If you've only met that one, the words mean the same thing. Uh, the pH of an aqueous solution of ethanoic acid, another calculation involving a weak acid. Okay, so you've got its Ka value. Here now is the Ka expression. You don't know, obviously, what H plus is. You need to work it out to work out the pH. So we let that be X. A minus will be the same because they're produced in equal numbers when HA dissociates. So it'll be X squared over its concentration, which is given to you as 0 0.1, bit of maths, and then negative log, and you have 2.87 as an answer. Okay, It's a weak acid, and as you'd expect then, the pH is quite high. You may recall in paper one, they showed the initial pH in a titration curve around about 3, so you can see that would work. Okay. Uh, determine the volume of water that would need to be added to 100 ml of HCl to change its pH from 2 to 3. Now, a pH of 2 to 3 means a 10 times difference in hydrogen ions. So we need to dilute this basically 10 times. And that means, that means taking 100 of this and adding 900 of water. So the total volume becomes 1,000. And that 100 has then been diluted 10 times, turning the pH from 2 to 3. Okay, I'm going to stop the video here, guys, because, again, it's going to run out of time, and I will continue shortly.